drive the nails in my hands laugh at me where you stand go away say it is me the day will come when you will see Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to see all of you this morning as we enter into Holy Week on this Palm Sunday. We are glad that you are here, those that are in person. We also want to welcome those that are online. We're so excited that we get to still worship a risen Savior together. Just a couple of announcements this morning. The first one is the Rise Against Hunger is today. Uh, we have made it there. So we're going to be packing 20,000 meals today. I've got two shifts. The first one's got a, almost full. Uh, at 2 o'clock, but the second shift, I'm still looking for, for some more folks. Uh, that's at 4 o'clock, and we're still about $2,000 away from our goal uh, of being able to cut that check for, for Rise Against Hunger, but we'll continue to, to take donations for that and, uh, and keep that going. But we will still be packing 20,000 meals today. Next week on Easter, we have our sunrise service. It'll be right out front here, uh, and we'll do that at 7 o'clock, so there'll be a sunrise service, and immediately following that, the United Methodist Men uh, will be doing a breakfast for those that, that have come to that. So uh, we hope to see you there on Easter, both at the sunrise service and then at our Easter services. And for the Easter service, don't forget your fresh cut flowers because we will have the cross up here that has, uh, has where you can put those flowers in it. So don't forget your flowers next week. And I think that is it for announcements. So let's go to God and invite him to be a part of our service this morning. 
Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this wonderful weather that we have been seeing and feeling and the spring and hope that is in the air. Lord, right now we ask that you would come and be a part of this service, that you would feel our hearts stir in us something new, that we might see you in a new and a fresh way. In your precious name we pray, amen. Why don't we stand and sing and praise our risen Savior together. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today on this Palm Sunday, and we give thanks. God, we thank you for the opportunity to remember everything that you did for us this Holy Week, the way that you came riding in and people waving palm branches as we remember that last supper that you had with your disciples, and then you went off to pray, saying, not my will, God, 
but yours be done. How you were taken and beaten for our sake. How you died on a cross for our sake, God. And then three days later, you rose again. God, we thank you that we have an opportunity to remember all that you have done for us because you love us so very much. God, we thank you for that sacrifice, and we just ask that this week, this holy week, that we remember it and we acknowledge it like we've never have before that you will touch us and that you will move in us and that your spirit will become alive within us this week. That we can see your face clearly. And that we will be so thankful that you desire a relationship with us, that you have called us by name and that we will seek you and desire the same relationship with you and that our lives will be fully transformed. God, we just ask that you come now and that you fill this place with your spirit. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. you're able let's please stand as we continue to worship the Lord in song together
Remain standing for just a moment. We will um, read God's word, but we also want to ask our children uh, to head out to Children's Church. This morning's passage of Scripture is John chapter 9, verses 1 through 13, and I ask you to pay close attention to it. I, I won't refer necessarily to every verse throughout the, the message, but they're all important. And actually, this story is at 41 verses. It's, it's 1 through 41, so we won't get all of those today, but, but we'll get the, the essence of the story. John 9, 1 through 13. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. This is the word of God for the gathered people of God. Please be seated. Um, I want to share with you some uh, great truths from small children. Uh, these are statements that children have made. No matter how hard you try, you can't baptize cats. When your mom is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair. If your sister hits you, don't hit her back. They always catch the second person. Never ask your three-year-old brother to hold a tomato. You can't trust dogs to watch your food. Reading what people write on desks can teach you a lot. Don't sneeze when someone is cutting your hair. Puppies still have bad breath even after eating a Tic Tac. Never hold a dustbuster and a cat at the same time. School lunches stick to the wall. You can't hide a piece of broccoli in a glass of milk. Don't wear polka dot underwear under white shorts. And the best place to be when you're sad is in grandma's lap. And then it's hard to unlearn a bad word. And ask why until you understand. Those are some very wise words from some very young folks. Um, this morning, I want to share with you about a person that some of you, I've shared about him before, and I might have even shared in this service before. His name is Nick uh, Vojcik, and Nick um, is a Slovakian, and he ended up living in Australia, but he was born without any arms and out without any legs. And uh, Nick, uh, for a period of time, really struggled with that reality. And what we're talking about today one of the main parts of it is why people suffer 
But mainly we're talking about um, why do we give God thanks? And why do we honor him? And why, why do we um, give him praise in our lives? Nick eventually came to the place um, where he made this statement. He said, there's no point of, of being whole on the outside if you're broken on the inside. And he also came to the place where he, he said that, that God said to him and spoke to him when he asked the question why, God spoke back to him, do you trust me? And ultimately, Nick said that he did. And because of that, he gave his life to Christ. And he became a passionate believer in Jesus. Um, I've got a short video clip that I want to share with you about that. What's your ultimate heart's desire? Honestly? Yeah, break it down. At 19, mm -hmm. I spoke in front of 300 sophomore students. And I only had seven minutes to talk. Within three minutes, half the girls were crying, and one girl was crying uncontrollably, and she was embarrassed because everybody saw her. She put up her hand, and she said, I'm so sorry, can I come up there and give you a hug? Mm -hmm. In front of everyone, she came and she hugged me, and she cried on my shoulder, and she said, no one's ever told me that they love me. No one's ever told me that I'm beautiful the way that I am. My life changed that day. Mm -hmm. I said, God, this is what I was born to do. I'm going to start ministry. This is my ministry for you. What's your ultimate heart's desire? Honestly? Yeah, break it down. At nine All right, if you, if you didn't hear the first part of that, um, she wanted to know what his heart's desire was, and he said he had, as he was a sophomore, he had seven, or I'm sorry, as a young person, he had seven minutes to speak to a sophomore class. And within three minutes, half the girls were crying, and one girl was crying uncontrollably. And you probably heard what she said. She said, um, nobody's ever told me that they love me, and nobody's ever told me that I was beautiful the way, just the way I am. And at that po point, he knew God was calling him to minister and to share what God, God had done in his life and the difference that he'd made and how he was a new person because of it, that he had put him together, that brokenness within, so that even the brokenness on the outside didn't matter, and he was able to minister to people about the grace of God. You know, one of the things that Nick says is that um, he anticipates and looks forward to the day that God makes him whole physically. And as a matter of fact, he believes in miracles. And, and for that reason, he, and I've heard him say it numerous times, he always he keeps a pair of shoes in his closet for that day. And, and that's the attitude I believe that the Lord wants us to have, to anticipate and know that the default position of God is that he wants good things for you. He wants you healed. And he wants you whole, both physically and emotionally and spiritually on the inside. Um, I want to read to you verse 3 again. Jesus answered, and, and, and again, I can't show you everything, but Nick says that this particular passage of Scripture is one of the things that enabled him to trust the Lord and to become a believer and then to be a minister. Verse 3, Jesus answered, I don't have this a small part for you to, to watch, so just listen. It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. And Nick understood that the works of God could be displayed in him as God had changed his heart in such a way that others could experience that same healing and that same level of grace. All right, today we're looking at a passage of Scripture where this beggar um, is, is suffering, and, and he's struggling. Now, what you need to know is that this event occurs at the seventh um, festival of the Jewish calendar of the year. In other words, there are seven major festivals, three that all the men were supposed to go to at some point during the year. And, and the seventh one is the very last one, and it's called Sukkot. It was the Feast of Tabernacles or Booze, and we've got some pictures, I think, of what that looks like in Israel today. It happens in September or October, depending upon the calendar. And they celebrate the wandering, the freedom, the land, the harvest, the end of the harvest. And it's a seven days that they live in booze. They build these booze, and they still do it, um, as this shows in Israel today, the Jewish people do. They use um, olive palm or myrtle branches to make these booze, and they look out to the stars in the same way that they did when they were wandering in the desert. And they're celebrating that time. Now, um, 
one thing you need to know, too, as you look at the Christian expression of those seven festivals, this one represents uh, living with the Lord and, and the Lord. And that day at which the new Jerusalem will come and the new heaven and the new earth are here and that the house of God is with the dwelling of man. And so that's what Sukkot represents from a Christian perspective um, prophetically. Now, during this time, during Sukkot, every day they also have what's called the water ceremony. And the water ceremony, um, it, Sukkot's happening at the end of the dry season, and so they're going into the time of the season of the rains, and every day at the end of the ceremony, they would, one of the priests would take a gold pitcher, and he would walk to the Pool of Siloam, pay attention here, that's what, that same place that we're talking about, he would get water, he would come back, and he would pour it into these silver-like pitch, um, uh, pitchers um, that uh, would be used for water offerings. And uh, people would chant, uh, Lord, save us, during that time period. It's the end of the ceremony for the day, and he would pour it in there, and that would be used for the water sacrifices um, uh, at the altar. And it, and it built every day. And every day it became more and more exciting and it became more and more powerful as they said, Lord, save us, because they're praying that the Lord would send rain and that, that he would save them, but also ultimately that he would save the people of Israel. So that's all going on during this festival that Jesus is at. And um, one of the other things you need to know is this, that there are four great menorahs, 75 feet high each in the court of women. And we've got some menorahs here too, I think. Um, <clears throat> that one in San Francisco is 24 feet high. The biggest one in the world, a permanent one, is this one in Indonesia. It's 62 feet high. And there were four of these in the court of women that were 75 feet high. And they were blazing with flames. And so these things, and, and keep these things in mind because they, they're very much related to what Jesus has said and is going to be saying here that we'll look at in just a minute. The first point that I want to share with you this morning is this. One of the reasons God allows suffering is to highlight his good works. One of the reasons he allows suffering is to highlight his good works. Now let's look at some, some scripture that relate to what we've just been talking about. On the last day of the feast, remember that day is the one where that water ceremony reaches a fever pitch and everybody's so excited it's the end of it. And when it's all done, they go back and they dismantle their booze and they head home. Um, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So, as you get a picture of this, this Jesus is, is really letting them know. I mean, he's letting them have it. He, he's saying, I am the source of water. Um, and, and thirst. I am the one that ultimately will quench your deepest thirst. Then John 8, 12, they're still at this feast time. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And, you know, picture these four giant menorahs, 75 feet in the air with these huge flames coming out. Um, uh, and Jesus makes this statement. He's still in Jerusalem. And then our passage, verses 1 and 2. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? You know, there are many reasons why someone would suffer. But in this particular case, we know that it's not sin or the parents' sin. And so we know that children do not suffer because of either their sins um, or their parents. That was a debate that went on during that day um, of Jesus. We know it's true. It's here in Scripture. Jesus helps us to understand that so that we won't be confused in that way. Now, what are the reasons that people suffer? Sometimes the reasons that people suffer is so that they might grow and so that they might grow in faith, that, that the Lord allows us to suffer. Sometimes um, to reveal the Lord to us. Sometimes, and one of the main reasons is because of persecution. One of the reasons that people suffer is because of evil in this world. It's a fallen world, and people are mean. And sometimes we suffer just because of that evil. And then lastly, sometimes the Lord 
uh, disciplines. But we have to understand and remember that the default and the one that we've got to understand is that God always wants to bless. He always wants to bring healing to both us and the world, everybody. He doesn't want us to suffer. He wants us to know his healing. Now, why was this man born blind? This is unique because we, we know why, because God himself tells us, because it's here in Scripture. Um, and so Jesus lets us know. How many of us here today are suffering now in a way that the works of God might be displayed? Does God want our lives in the way that he meets our needs, in the way that he heals us maybe physically? Does he want himself to be honored and glorified by what we're experiencing? You know, when I'm suffering, honestly, I'm tempted to doubt the Lord and to complain. You know, how about you? Is that kind of our natural response as human beings? Our flesh wants to complain. Our flesh wants to say, well, the Lord, you know, he's letting me down. He's failing. When in reality, many times the Lord instead wants other people to look to Jesus. He wants us to look to Jesus so that he can meet the needs in a powerful way and so that he can be glorified. This man had to wait an awfully long time. He had been uh, born this way from birth. He was born blind. How long have you been suffering? Has it been a lifetime? Has your faith grown? Do you think that you can trust the Lord with the pain that you experience? Jesus wants so badly to heal our pain. He wants more to heal our pain than we want the pain to be healed. However, he doesn't want it to be healed a moment too soon. He wants us to experience all that he has for us. He wants to, uh, us to experience his glory. He wants us to experience his goodness and his grace. The second point that I want to share this morning is this. Jesus makes the blind to see. He makes the blind to see. You know, I'm fascinated with the fact that Jesus doesn't say a word to this man. I mean, if you look at the whole thing, he doesn't say anything to him before he heals him. Um, he's speaking to his disciples and he's talking to them, um, but he just spits on the ground, makes some mud, and slaps it in his eyes. And, and that's the way that he heals him. Now, one of the things that we need to understand is that we're going through the seven sign miracles of, of the book of John that help us understand the person and the nature of Jesus. And remember a few weeks back, Matt preached on the man who was healed at the pool of Bethesda. And there, Jesus actually said, do you want to be healed? He spoke to him. And he's the only person in the Gospels where Jesus asked them if, he actually, if they actually want to be healed in the first place. And so the contrast is important. They're both healed in Jerusalem. And so these two healings are, are something that we've got to learn about. And you need to think about um, uh, these two folks and how they respond differently. All right. Verse number uh, six, nine verse six. <clears throat> Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. All right. <clears throat> Remember, this guy is blind. And so he can't see anything, but he is very sensitive to sound. And so he most likely has heard everything that's going on. Most likely he's heard the disciples' question, and he's definitely heard Jesus' answer. And then he hears Jesus stop talking, and he hears him spit. And then he hears him sloshing around in it, making mud. And then he comes to him and puts it in his eyes. You know, there's another passage of Scripture where uh, the Bible talks about creating out of the soil. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. What, did Jesus, uh, what Jesus did that day was just as creative. He was creating sight for the, for the blind, a man who was born blind. And as it's stated in this passage of Scripture, um, nobody had been healed who had been born blind in the recorded history to that point. And so Jesus is doing a creative miracle. This is one of the sign miracles, remember. And so he's pointing to the fact that he can give sight to the blind. And people, even 
that have been born that way and lived that way all his life. He wants to open up new worlds. He opens up a new world for this man. He wants to open up new worlds for you and me in the ways in which he reveals himself and the ways in which he heals us. And then verse 7. And said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, at first glance, this sounds like a simple thing. Okay, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. But remember, this guy is blind, right? And on top of that, Jesus has just put mud in his eyes. And on top of that, the pool of Siloam is a long ways away from the temple. Um, I want, we've got some pictures of a diagram. You can see that black dot at the top is the temple mount. And then you see that trail of black all the way down to the big circle at the bottom. That's the pool of Siloam. It was fed by the the spring of Gihon, and, and now some other pictures. These are passageways. Um, that's the gutter under the street that have been recently uncovered in, uh, in Jerusalem by archaeologists. Um, these are stone streets. Those are the streets. There are three major stairwells that he has to travel to get to the Pool of Siloam. He's blind. He's got mud in his eyes, and now he's got to travel all that way down to the Pool of Siloam to get it washed. Why did Jesus do it that way? This is a unique healing, and Jesus often does his healings in a specific way for specific people. In this case, he makes him take a step of faith. He makes him travel a fairly long distance, and ultimately, um, he makes him go to the Pool of Siloam. Again, the source of the water the source of that blessing where the Lord quenches our deepest thirst. And he wants to make sure that this man understands it. He wants to make sure you and I understand it, that there's more than just healing his blind eyes. He's healing his heart and his soul. And he's encountering the Messiah himself. And he wants to make sure that this man understands that. All right. Is there anything that God's told you to do recently? where he's called you to step out in faith in response to your needs? Have you moved? Have you stepped out in faith and obedience to him? Because many times it requires that for us to experience the healing that he wants for us. Let me tell you the rest of the story. All right, so this man, uh, his neighbors ultimately begin to argue with him whether he is the man and whether he actually got healed. And then they turn him in to the Pharisees, and then the Pharisees question him. And then the Pharisees don't believe that he was born blind, so they bring his parents in, and they question his parents. And his parents are afraid that they're going to get into trouble with the religious leaders because they know that anybody that says Jesus is Messiah is banished from the temple. And so they say, he's old enough, he's an adult. Yes, it's him. Yes, he was born blind, but we have no idea how he was healed. And so they bring him back in again. And they question him again. And again, he answers all the questions, how Jesus has healed him. And he begins to argue with them about who he is. And he gives, and they say, um, they bring him back in and they say, um, this man is a sinner. Give God, God glory for your healing, but this man is a sinner. And, and he um, is shocked by their response because he knows that this man has done a spectacular miracle, and he stands up for Jesus. And some people believed, even in the Pharisees. The third and final point I want to share with you this morning is this. We thank Jesus because he makes our blind eyes see God. He makes our blind eyes see God. Not only can he heal us physically, but he helps reveal our, who he is and reveals um, his grace and his mercy so that we might be saved. Verse 25 reads this way. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And this man begins to give testimony. He argues with the Pharisees, um, and, and he says, you don't know where he's from? Because they admit they have no idea where he's from. And he says, that's amazing, because we know that God doesn't listen to sinners that he only listens to people that are godly. And this man has done a miracle that nobody has ever done before. He's healed a man 
who is born blind. And at that point, they turn on him and they say, you are steeped in sin and you're trying to, to lecture us. Then verses 35 um, through 36, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? As a Jew, this man understood um, who Jesus was talking about. The Son of Man was a, a term for the Messiah. It came from um, Daniel chapter 7. And when Jesus used that term, this man understood that he's talking about the Messiah. And then verses 37 through 38, Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said to him, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. You know, uh, as this man worshiped him, as he recognized him as Messiah, he believed in him. He said, yes, I believe. And, and he began to worship him and honor him. We believe that Jesus is the Christ. We believe that he is our Savior. But the question is, do we worship him with the same vitality, with the same passion that this man did on that day? When Jesus is revealed to him, not only has he brought healing to him, but he's brought salvation to him. He's communicated his love and his forgiveness to him. Do we have that same vibrancy in our love and our thankful hearts? You know, again, these two men are compared. The man who's um, healed in the pool of Bethesda and the man who's healed of blindness from birth. As a pastor, as a youth pastor, um, I worked with teenagers um, for 14 years. And then as a pastor, we did all sorts of mission projects and other things. And, and sometimes you administer to a family or to people or to individuals, and they have different responses. You know, the Lord calls us to serve. He calls us to give to people that are struggling. He, he calls us to, to love on and care for people that are hurting. But the way people respond varies, doesn't it? Sometimes people were very grateful, and they were very thankful. I remember um, going into a house where... Um, there were cracks in the walls that you could see through. And we were bringing, at this time, Christmas gifts to these children. And the mother allowed them, she invited us into the house, and she allowed them to open their gifts up, and, and they did it right there in front of us at that time, and they went crazy. They were so excited. And she was so thankful. And, you know, you're looking through the cracks in the building, and she's got this kerosene heater on um, in December, keeping them warm. And to see her grateful heart was beautiful. But there are other times when uh, you're just as generous to people, and maybe even more so, and they don't show response. Jesus had a similar experience. This man at the pool of Bethesda, what does he do? Um, he's not a grateful man. I mean, he doesn't turn to him in the same way that this man does and to worship him. Verses 39 through 41 read this way. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. The Pharisees and the religious leaders thought they had everything that they needed. They didn't think they needed a savior. They thought they lived according to rules and those rules would save them. They were blind and didn't know it. And Jesus wanted to make sure that they did. He wanted them to know the healing. He wanted them to know his grace and his mercy. But instead, their blindness kept them blind to their sinfulness and their need for a Savior. You know, the man from the pool of Bethesda, John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, read this way. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. You know, Matt, when he preached this passage and, and looked at that passage, what he said was that Jesus was talking about something different than physical. He was talking about his spirituality, 
something that was much more important, that something much worse could happen to him. And unfortunately, that man, with an ungrateful heart, all he did was turn Jesus over to the authorities. And the scriptures say that from that day forward, they pursued Jesus and persecuted him because he healed on the Sabbath. Jesus sees us, and he loves us right where we're at. And sometimes we're not very grateful. And other times, we can be. It's important that we follow and understand that Jesus also calls us to minister in his name, to do it with the same passion regardless of how people respond, because he did the same. Sometimes they'll be grateful, and sometimes they won't. But it doesn't matter because we love the way Jesus loves. And we continue to do it so that he might be glorified. Why do you think Jesus healed this man with spit and dirt? Now, one of the reasons is clear. He is showing that he has creative ability. And he's bringing us back to Genesis. It's Palm Sunday. Jesus through these passages of Scripture, he's keeping a low profile. But on Palm Sunday, it's very different. He comes in at the shouts of Hosanna to the people of Jerusalem. He comes in on a donkey as the one who's who's the king. The first thing that he does is he goes into the temple and he says that you've turned my house into a den of thieves. And then he drives them out. The only person that's allowed to take care of the house is the owner. Jesus is saying to everybody at Palm Sunday, guys, you either kill me or you worship me as Messiah. And he's calling us to that same place. We either reject Christ or we make him Lord of everything that there is in our hearts and our lives. Why did Jesus heal this man with spit and dirt? In Papua New Guinea, Um, there's a people group there, and they have um, uh, witch doctors. And their witch doctors are their people of healing. And they're called spitters because they spit in the soil, and they use different things to bring healing. But spit is a big part of the way that they heal. And when the Wycliffe Bible translators came to Papua New Guinea and they began to share the gospel, when they read this story... To the people of Papua New Guinea, it clicked in their hearts and their minds, and they understood Jesus is the master spitter, and they gave their hearts to Jesus. He heals us on the outside, but more importantly, he heals us on the inside, and he knows exactly where you and I are. He knows exactly what we need to hear, and he knows exactly how to approach us, and he offers his blood and his grace. We're to respond in the same way. Why do we give thanks to him? Because he gives us everything. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we bow before you this day. We give you praise and we give you thanks. And we acknowledge you as the son of man and we want to worship you and to honor you with the same passion that this man who was born blind did. Help us, Father, to be genuine disciples and followers. Father, we pray that you would help us to minister to those that are around us, not seeking necessarily always gratitude, but out of obedience and out of your example. Help us to love and to sacrifice. Help us to have a heart of compassion for those that suffer and hurt. And we pray ultimately that Jesus will be glorified. Father, thank you for loving us this way. Thank you for being with us. And Lord, if there's anybody here who needs to trust Jesus, um, maybe with their deepest hurts, I ask that you'd help them to do it today and to say in simple words in prayer, to say, Lord, I need you. And yes, I need to trust you with my pain and my suffering. I thank you that you've entered into that pain and suffering. And that you've been willing to go to the cross to die for my sins, my burdens, and Lord, even my wounds. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for filling me with your spirit. 
and healing my heart. Help us, Lord God, to be disciples that follow close to Jesus, our rabbi. We pray all these things in the matchless, powerful name of Jesus, your son. Amen. Uh, we don't um, collect an offering, and so you can put your offering in the narthex, and those of you that are online can do that electronically. We want to continue to worship the Lord and lift high the name of Jesus. Let's stand and sing together.
I'm going to remain up here. Uh, Matt and Michelle will greet you all on your way out of that door. But um, I'm going to remain up here. If there's anybody that would like prayer uh, for healing or whatever issue may be on your heart, I'd love to pray with you. Um, if the Lord's been pressing on your heart to join this fellowship of believers, um, come forward and I'd love to talk to you about that as well. Today's Palm Sunday and next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And our Savior sees us where we are. He approaches each of us. He is the light of this world. He is the source that will quench your deepest thirst. And each of us know, folks, that need to know that same healing. They need to know his touch. They need to know his washing and cleansing. And if you love and care for folks that you know need Christ, next Sunday is a great day to bring them to help them know that you love them and that you'll walk with them as they encounter Christ. Be filled with his spirit, trust him with your deepest hurts, and go in his powerful love. Amen.
great day, Trinity.